Right, if you want to turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel, we are up to chapter 10. <laughs> 2 Samuel chapter 10 then says this. In the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died and his son Hanun succeeded him as king. David thought, I will show kindness to Hanun, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanun concerning his father. When David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite commander said to Hanun, their lord, do you think David is honouring your father by sending envoys to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you only to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanun seized David's envoys, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments at the buttocks, and sent them away. When David was told about this, he sent messengers to meet the men, for they were greatly humiliated. The king said, stay at Jericho till your beards have grown, and then come back. When the Ammonites realized that they had become obnoxious to David, they hired 20,000 Aramean foot soldiers from Beth Rehob and Zobah, as well as the king of Makkah with a thousand men, and also 12,000 men from Tob. On hearing this, David sent Joab out with the entire army of fighting men. The Ammonites came out and drew up in battle formation at the entrance of their city gate, while the Arameans of Zobah and Rehob and the men of Tob and Makkah were by themselves in the open country. Joab saw that there were battle lines in front of him and behind him, so he selected some of his best troops and deployed them against the Arameans. He put the rest of the men under the command of Abishai, his brother, and deployed them against the Ammonites. Joab said, if the Arameans are too strong for me, then you are to come to my rescue. But if the Ammonites are too strong for you, then, you will, I, then I will come to your rescue. Be strong, and let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. Then Joab and the troops with him advanced to fight the Arameans, and they fled before him. When the Ammonites realized that the Arameans were fleeing, they fled before Abishai and went inside the city. So Joab returned from fighting the Ammonites and came to Jerusalem. After the Arameans saw that they had been routed by Israel, they regrouped. Hadadezer, they had the Arameans brought from beyond the river Euphrates. They went to Helam with Shobak, the commander of Hadadezer's army, leading them. When David was told of this, he gathered all Israel, crossed the Jordan, and went to Helam. The Arameans formed their battle lines to meet David, and they fought against him. But they fled before Israel, and David killed 700 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers. He also struck down Shobak, the commander of the army, and he died there. When all the kings who were vassals of Hadadezer saw that they had been routed by Israel, they made peace with the Israelites and became subject to them. So the Arameans were afraid to help the Ammonites anymore. I wonder, as you kind of stop and reflect back over what you've seen of King David and his exploits so far in 2 Samuel, what do you think it would have been like to have been an Israelite under David's rule and reign? What would it have felt like, do you think? Well, what would you have thought about your king? What would you have thought about life in God's kingdom? A few weeks back, we saw in chapter 8 kind of a summary of where things were up to. It summarized the extent and the nature of God's kingdom under David. The borders were secure, the nations around them, north, east, south, and west, all subdued, rest for his people, David ruling with justice and righteousness. It feels like it would have been a great time to have been an Israelite, doesn't it? What about, though, if you were one of the neighboring countries, if you lived in one of the nations around Israel? How would you have felt having King David ruling next door, do you think? under Yahweh his God. How would that have made you feel in that situation? What would you have seen as you looked in or, or as you heard on the grapevine about David's exploits and how he's dealt with his people and his enemies? How would that have made you feel? What about us here this evening, some 3,000 years later? What do we make of David? I wonder what you've made of him as you've worked your way through his rule, his reign, his kingship. Uh, whether you're a Christian here this evening, a follower of Jesus, uh, already part of God's kingdom, 
Uh, how does it make you feel to look back on the life of David and as he's pointed you to our greater king, King Jesus? Or maybe, uh, actually, you're here this evening, you're not a Christian, you're just here, you're interested, you're looking in. Well, what we're going to see from David about life in God's kingdom and under God's rule really matters. It really matters. I think it's actually an important question because many of us have an inherent distrust of power and authority and those in power and authority, don't we? Uh, in, just instinctively, uh, we think about our politicians, and I'm not making any political comments this evening, but we think about our politicians, and uh, a recent poll suggested that only 9% of the British public say that they trust politicians. Uh, broken promises, scandals, corruption, perceived self-interest, perhaps it's easy to understand why that might be the case. Or maybe we look to history, whether recent or, or kind of ancient history, and we see dictator figures, the Vladimir Putins of this world, uh, Napoleon, uh, people like that. Uh, I saw, I don't know if you saw the recent film on Napoleon, I watched it on a plane back at Easter. Um, fascinating film, he's kind of held up, isn't he, this kind of, he came from nowhere and he conquered everything, this amazing military leader, but the film really exposes his real lust, his clamour for power. Uh, one of the climaxes of the film is where he's being proclaimed emperor and he grabs the crown himself off the Pope and sticks it on his own head. His lust for power is enormous. And whilst he might have won great victories for his people, actually the death toll amongst French soldiers was astronomical. Great cost to his people. Some three million died in the Napoleonic Wars. Maybe we look to figures like that and we, we distrust power and authority. Maybe your own experience has led you to distrust power and authority, whether at work or, or at school, in your own family perhaps. At Durham University, where I work, they did a, a staff survey recently. You might have had similar things done where, where you work. And less than 40% of people said that they have confidence in the senior leadership. Uh, I suspect that's fairly typical. Uh, actually, more strikingly, I find when I started working there, I went and met with each of the individuals in the team that I joined, just to kind of catch up, get to know them a little bit. And almost all of them had a story about how they had been mistreated, abused by their boss or by their boss's boss at some point in their career. It was remarkable. Uh, one lady spoke about how uh, she felt that he, she had been uh, pooed on from on high and she didn't use quite such uh, uh, tender language. It's sad, isn't it? But maybe that's been your experience too. Because we've seen power and authority abused, perhaps we've experienced it ourselves, we're all tempted to assume that life under God's authority must also be a bad thing. We're tempted and the world at large believes that life under God's authority, under his king, is a bad thing and that we would be better off without it. Well, is that the case? Is that the case? Let's dive into our text this evening and see what it has to say. So it'd be, it would be great if you could have, have that passage open in front of you, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 10, uh, so that you can check that what I'm saying is what God's word is saying to us. Uh, chapter 10 is the second of two snapshots, really looking at David's heart as a ruler and life under his rule. Uh, back in chapter 9 and again in chapter 10, we get these two snapshots, which I, I find it fascinating that the author of Samuel has included these two episodes in the book at all. You see, we had that summary, didn't we, back in chapter 8, as we've mentioned, that, that was kind of told us all about David's rule, the kind of over, oversight of it. And it even included some of the details of, of the episode we're going to read about this evening, about the Arameans. Uh, we've been told that the Lord gave David victory wherever he went, and that David rules over his people with justice and righteousness. So what do these two chapters add? Why does the author include them at all? Well, I think the key is in what links the two passages. I wonder if you spotted it. If you were here a couple of weeks ago when you were in chapter 9, and again this evening, uh, there's a link between the two passages that comes right at the beginning of each. So, so look back with me at chapter 9 and verse 1. And there we're told that David asks, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? He wanted to show kindness to the descendants of Saul. Uh, and now have a look with me at chapter 10 and verses 1 and 2. We're told in the course of time, the king of the Ammonites died and his son Hanun succeeded him as king. And David thought, I will show kindness to Hanun, son of Nahash, just as his father showed kindness to me. Do you see the link? David is wanting to show kindness. Your uh, Bible translation might say loyalty in the second one, but it's the same word. It's the, the Hebrew word that I think Matt taught you a couple of weeks ago. Does anyone remember it? Hesed. 
Hesed. Hesed is the Hebrew word, and it gets after more than just kindness. There's a, there's a covenant loving kindness, a faithfulness, a loyalty, a steadfast love that kind of underpins that word. It's usually used of God in the way that he deals with his people. But here we see David wanting to show it to others. First of all, a descendant of Saul, and now a neighboring king. So in these two chapters, right at the heart of 2 Samuel, right in the center of it, that in a sense the author didn't need to include, actually what we see is the heart of God's king, who is himself a man after God's own heart, and we show that what is his, his greatest inclination is to show loving kindness. That's what he longs to do. That's how he most naturally acts. Who can I show loving kindness to? Who can I show this hesed love towards? And in this chapter, we, we see that it's towards the nations around him. Uh, David could have used this as an opportunity. The, the death of the Ammonite king uh, could have been an opportunity for him to attack, to conquer, to oppress, to take over, and, and to kind of you know, build up his own borders even further. But in instead, David sees it as an opportunity to show steadfast, loving kindness. That is a remarkable thing that that is how God's king would instinctively act. Uh, David himself has been a recipient of God's hesed love towards him. He knows that that is what God is all about. He'll have known the scriptures, Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, when the Lord is speaking to Moses and introducing himself, so to speak, and explaining who he is and what he's like. And the Lord says this to Moses, Who am I? I am the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, that same word, abounding in hesed, steadfast, loving kindness. And then we see David speaking of God's love to him all through the Psalms. As you read through the Psalms, that's where you'll find most uses of this word. And David just rejoices that God loves him in that way. Uh, Psalm 23 is a great example. We know Psalm 23 well. It speaks of the Lord being David's shepherd. And right at the end of that psalm, David says this, Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Do you know that verse? Surely goodness and love, God's steadfast love, will follow me all the days of my life. It says follow me in most of our translations. Actually, the word should be better translated pursue. It's coming after me. It's chasing after me. It's going to track me down, says David. That is what God's love does. It comes after us to bless us not to do us harm. So let me ask us this evening, is that how we think of God's rule, his power, his authority, the way that he most instinctively acts? He moves out in loving kindness towards others. That was David's experience, and that was how he now wanted to act towards the nations around him. But the key question that then comes in this chapter is, how will Hanun respond? How will Hanun respond? Uh, look down with me at what happened. Verse 2, David sent a delegation to express his sympathy to Hanun concerning his father. When David's men came to the land of the Ammonites, the Ammonite nobles said to Hanun their lord, Do you think David is honoring your father by sending men to you to express sympathy? Hasn't David sent them to you to explore the city and spy it out and overthrow it? So Hanun seized David's men, shaved off half of each man's beard, cut off their garments in the middle at the buttocks, and sent them away. Hanun and his associates assume the worst of David's motives, don't they? He's not come to show you loving kindness, to express sympathy. No, he's come to try and trick you, to spy out the city, to then come back with his armies and seize it and overthrow it. And so Hanun rejects David's kindness, and he humiliates David's men, that's what he's trying to do there when he cuts off their beards in half, in, uh, you know, presumably down the, down the centre of one half. They would look ridiculous, wouldn't they? And it, particularly in that culture, to not have had a beard uh, would have been a great shame to them. And then he cuts off their garments in the middle and literally sends them off half naked uh, to walk back uh, to, to Israel. He seeks to throw off God's rule. And what comes from that? Well, look down with me again. When David was told about this, he sent messengers to meet the men, for they were greatly humiliated. The king said, stay at Jericho till your beards have grown back, and then come back. 
Interestingly, David's first response is not one of anger and aggression towards Hanun, is it? It's one of compassion to his people. David is not the aggressor here. You'd have thought you might turn around and say, right, that's it. I've had it. You don't dare treat my men like that. You're going to reject my offer of loving kindness. Right, that's it. I'm coming for you. But he doesn't. We don't actually hear anything of that. Uh, the next thing that happens uh, is that the Ammonites, verse 6, realize that they've become an offense to David's nostrils. They realize, oh, now, what have we done? Now we're going to be for it. And they're the ones that go off and uh, get a, a, a higher an army. Do you see that? From the Arameans who live up to the north, the, the Syrians, you might have them in, in your Bible. They had 20,000 Arameans, uh, and then another 1,000, another 12,000 from Tob. They amass a great army, uh, and they come. Uh, and want to see if they can uh, defeat David and his people in battle. Well, on hearing this, verse 7, uh, let's read on. David sent Joab out with the entire army of fighting men. So David is going to engage him. He is going to defend his people. The Ammonites came out and drew up in battle formation at the entrance of their city gate, while the Arameans of Zobah and Rehob and the men of Tob and Makkah were by themselves in the open country. So they've set themselves up in two lines, one by the city gate and one out in the open country. And so Joab realized that there are battle lines in front of him and behind him. He's surrounded. They've kind of got him in a, in a pincer movement. Uh, what's he going to do? Well, he's a good commander. Uh, he knows uh, what his best bet is. He splits up his troops. He deploys some of them against the Arameans, we're told in verse 9, and puts the rest of the men under his command, uh, the command of Abishai's brother, and deploys them against the Ammonites. And he says, look, if the Ammonites are... The Arameans are too strong for me, then come and help me out. If the Ammonites are too strong for you, then I'll come and help you out. But ultimately, he knows that this is in the Lord's hands. Verse 12. Be strong, let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God, and the Lord will do what is good in his sight. And so here we are all set up for this epic battle scene. It does feel like something that could be there in Napoleon or another kind of uh, war film. And look what happens, verse 13. Joab and the troops with him advanced to fight the Arameans, and they fled before him. It's a bit of an anticlimax, isn't it? And when the Ammonites saw that the Arameans were fleeing, they fled before Abishai and went inside the city. The Lord has given victory. And when the Lord gives victory, he gives victory. We don't know the details of the battle. We don't need to know. But we know that as soon as they went up against them, God's enemies fled. But again, look what happens next, verse 14. Joab returned from fighting the Ammonites and came to Jerusalem. Again, David isn't looking to press home the advantage here. He's not being the aggressor. He's not wanting to go again and think, great, here's my opportunity. They've come and opposed me. Uh, that's it. No, he uh, brings Joab home. But the Arameans haven't had enough yet. Verse 15. Uh, after the Arameans saw that they had been uh, routed by Israel, they regrouped. And Hadadiza, their king, uh, brought more Arameans from beyond the river. So he's gone all the way up north to the Euphrates, and he's brought an even bigger army down. And he's brought uh, Shobak, the commander of Hadadiza's army, leading them. Uh, David is told of this, verse 17. And so he gathers all Israel and crosses the Jordan and goes to Helam. And the Arameans formed their battle lines to meet David and fought against him. But they fled before Israel. And David killed 700 of their charioteers and 40,000 of their foot soldiers and struck down Shobak, the commander of their army, and he died there. The Lord gives the victory. The Lord gives the victory, and David ultimately utterly destroys and decimates the armies of the Arameans and Hadadiz and those who had stood against him. The Lord has done what is good in his sight, hasn't he? Just as Joab said he would. He's given his king victory over those who oppose him, and he's given his people peace and rest. Hanun rejected the loving kindness of God's king. That's what we see here, isn't it? He was offered David saying, I'll show you kindness. I'll express God's loving kindness towards you. And Hanun rejects it. And he seeks to oppose David and throw him off. And he finds himself utterly destroyed. As to Hadadiza and the Arameans who came to their help and were so determined to defeat David. But God gives the victory. So what have we seen in this chapter? We've seen that God's king loves to show steadfast loving kindness. That is his nature, that is his inclination. And we've seen as well that God's king will defeat those who oppose him and reject his love. God's king will defeat those who oppose him and reject his love. 
Uh, and I think we're meant to see here that this whole episode is illustrative of a broader truth about how people in general respond to God's kingdom and his king. It's a truth that we see in Psalm 2. I'm going to turn there in a minute. But the whole episode feels like kind of a, a lived out picture of what we see in Psalm 2. So why don't you turn with me to, to that psalm and we'll just spend a moment or two looking at Psalm 2 because it's going to help reinforce some of these lessons from Samuel. Just flick over to Psalm 2. Don't worry, this isn't kind of sermon part 2. We'll just have a quick look here and then we're going to see how this all points us to Jesus. But look at Psalm 2 and see if you can spot some of the similarities to what we've just read about Hanun and how he responded uh, to David. Verse 1 begins, Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The nations assume that God's rule is a bad thing, don't they? How can we get rid of God? How can we get rid of him and his king? How can we break their chains and throw off their fetters? That's what they want to do. They've misunderstood entirely who God is and what he's like, and they want rid of him. But look down to verse 4. God won't be mocked. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them, and then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. And then he goes on to speak of this king of his. He says, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. This is the true king, God's true anointed king, the Christ, the son who does and who will reign forever and who can and will, if they continue to oppose him, dash them to pieces like pottery. But then how does the psalm end? Well, it ends with an amazing warning and a peace treaty. Look with me at verse 10. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son. Come to him and submit to him, lest he be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. But blessed are all who take refuge in him. Here's this amazing peace treaty, isn't it? This offer to these kings who want to get rid of God's rule and reign over their lives. They think it's a bad thing, a curse. And he says, no, it's a blessing. Come and submit to my king and you will find refuge and blessing in him. I think we're meant to be left at the end of 2 Samuel chapter 10, thinking to ourselves, wow, what a great king David is. What a great king David is. His deepest inclination is to show loving kindness. He will and does when he needs to defeat his enemies and give peace and rest to his people. He rules in justice. We're left thinking, if only David was the same yesterday and today and forever. But he's not. He's not the one that Psalm 2 is ultimately speaking of, of course. We're going to see that next week as you, or whenever you come to chapter 11, the episode with Bathsheba. Um, Spoiler alert, it all goes horribly wrong for David. And it's horrific. It devastatingly exposes his sin. I actually think that the writer has been really clever in the way that he's put together this book, because actually I think we've we've linked together chapter 10 with kind of uh, chapters 9 and 8 beforehand, But actually, if you look at the beginning of chapter 10, there's this little phrase, in the course of time, in verse 1, in the course of time. And that's a a little marker that the author uses just to signal a new section of his book, in the course of time. And then he speaks about the Ammonites, uh, first of all. And at the end of chapter 12, after the episode with Bathsheba and Uriah and Nathan and all that's going to come, we get a little section speaking about how David completed the defeat of the Ammonite armies. So actually, I think, whilst there are clearly links back with chapters 8 and 9 and what's come before, I think the author is telling us here, no, this is linking to what's coming. This is going to show us what David, sadly, is and can be like. It's going to expose his sin. We're going to see that David actually is not a king who loves perfectly. He is not a king who can offer his people everlasting peace and rest. You will not necessarily find 
blessing if you take refuge in David, as Uriah will sadly discover. But there is another king, isn't there, brothers and sisters? There is another king, the one whom Psalm 2 is actually speaking of. And so as we come to a close, let's just turn our eyes upon our King Jesus. Uh, Would you turn with me to Matthew's Gospel? And we'll look at just a couple of verses from Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 27. Jesus has been speaking about the kingdom of God a lot in Matthew's gospel and how he is the one who is now representing God's kingdom on earth. And in verse 27, he says this, all things have been committed to be by my father. Again, it's that language of Psalm 2, isn't it, that we saw. Here is the son, the true king, all things committed to him by the father. And then cast your eye down to verse 28. What is this son, this king like? What is his message for the people? Verse 28, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for my soul, for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus says, come to me, take my yoke upon you. That's the same word as is used back in Psalm 2, the, the chains and the fetters that the kings were trying to throw off, thinking it's a, it's a terrible thing to be under God's yoke under his rule under his reign we don't want it we think it's a curse and jesus says no come to me take my yoke upon you and it will be a blessing to you you will find rest for your souls under the love of king jesus so what have we seen this evening. Hanun showed us what it is to reject the love of God's king. When he and Hadadezer opposed God's king, they were inevitably defeated. (coughs) Psalm 2 has pointed us to Jesus because we need a better king than King David, don't we? We need one in whom we can take refuge and find rest. And in Matthew 11, we see Jesus offering exactly that. If you're already one of King Jesus' people, Shouldn't we rejoice in his steadfast loving kindness towards us? Shouldn't we adore him for what a great and glorious and gracious and merciful king that he is? Can't we take great comfort from knowing that he is a king also who will stand for his people and he will ultimately defeat his enemies? Do you remember how Mephibosheth responded to David's uh, loving kindness towards him? He said, who am I? Who am I? I'm a dead dog. Why would you do this for me? He's just humbled and awed, isn't he? That should be our response to to this amazing love of King Jesus. And if you're not already submitting to King Jesus, perhaps you're wary of those in power and authority. Can I urge you to, to look again at the heart of Jesus, God's King? You do need to heed the warning of our passage this evening. Those who reject God's love and oppose his rule, they will not win. You cannot overthrow God. He will not be mocked. But why would you want to throw off the yoke of King Jesus? No, submit to it and you will find rest for your souls. Come to me, says Jesus. This is God's king. This is life in God's kingdom. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Shall we pray together? (coughs) Let's bow our heads and let's pray.